All right. For so for this, the penultimate uh, lecture for uh, financial markets, I wanted to talk about uh, nonprofit and government finance. Uh, so uh, let me first uh, recall some of the some of the basic themes of this course. Finance is really about incentivizing people to do good work and managing risks. Uh, these issues are not confined to the private sector, to the business sector. They're very deep and central problems to all people. Uh, the big problem, I put it in the most broad terms, just about everything that we do that's good is done as part of a team. It's hard to think of something that you alone can do. Uh, and so the problem with teams is that people have their own individual c concerns and incentives and doesn't always yield teamwork. <laughs> so that's what I think finance is really about. Uh, so you might think I'm wrong that some of the greatest achievements in history were done by single individuals. Uh, so I don't know what you might think of. What comes to my mind is, how about Albert Einstein, <laughs> right? His theories. He was sitting in a, a patent office in Switzerland uh, and uh, uh, just doodling on a piece of paper and came up with the whole theory of relativity. But you see, that would be a mistake to think that because, in fact, he had gotten a PhD in physics from the Zurich Polytechnic, <laughs> which was a nonprofit organization. Uh, and he relied on journals of physics. He could not have done it if he didn't read what other physicists were doing. And journals were organizations that had financing, I, I assume nonprofit. So uh, well I thought of another example. Uh, Charles Darwin, the great physicist, not physicist, the great naturalist. <laughs> uh, uh, people point out that he wasn't affiliated. He was like an, uh, he was on his own. He wasn't part of a university. Uh, he got uh, I guess he got financing, but uh, kind of on his own. But he couldn't have written the uh, origin of species by himself. In fact, he got financing from uh, private donors for the Beagle. Uh, you know this trip around the two-year voyage he made around the world, where he collected specimens and information. Uh, it actually goes back to his professor. Uh, he had a professor Henslow at Cambridge University, who was a botanist, uh, and Henslow arranged for <laughs> Darwin's voyage and sent him off. Uh, so you know these are organizations that I, I don't think you can do much good. Some people would say, well, how about a poet? Uh, a poet. Uh, sometimes they're even Homer was a blind poet, right? <laughs> he just. He didn't have anything. He, he, he memorized everything. He didn't even write it down. He just memorized everything. He just sat there and thought. But even he must have had financing because um, he traveled around the uh, world of his day and, and made his poems known. Otherwise, they wouldn't survive. Other people learned them. And he must have had financing for this. <laughs> it must have been a business. So that's the general theme. Um, now I'm going to talk today. Uh, there's so much to talk about, but I'm going to try to see how much of this I can uh, cover well. I want to start by talking about nonprofit organizations. These are organizations who have a purpose stated in their charter, other than making money. Okay, uh, and then I want to talk about government <coughs> involvement in for-profit. That for-profit companies are not completely clear. Uh, of uh, a social interest as well. Um, then I'm going to talk about government finance of projects, uh, and then finally government social insurance. I'm hoping that this lecture will um, remind you of things that you can do because in all these sectors there are things that you can do. So one of the themes of this course was you should have a purpose and you sh in life, and it should not be making money <laughs> per se. Uh, and, and you think of finance as a tool that you can use to help you achieve this purpose. So that's what I want to talk about. So, um, so let me uh, start then with uh, nonprofits. 
Okay, a nonprofit organization. You can be a corporation uh, that uh, is is a organization set up for a charitable cause or a good cause, uh, and it has no owners uh, in the sense that uh, a regular corporate. There's no shareholders. The profits go back to the organization for its purposes. So right now you're sitting, in, as I mentioned before, Yale is a nonprofit. It has no owners. It, it's a person, legal person in itself, uh, but it has a board of directors. Uh, in the United States in 2010, there were 1.6 million nonprofits. It's huge. Well, the U.S. is probably the country that has the strongest. Nonprofit sector. Uh, my number for the United Kingdom may be out of date. It was 120,000. Uh, it's part of the U.S. culture that nonprofits are big, that uh, it goes back to the founding ideas of this country that uh, we don't have the government running everything. We do things on our own, uh, on our own initiative. Uh, of course, it's not just the U.S., there are nonprofits in, in every country. But uh, that's a lot of nonprofits, and they uh, recently accounted for about 4% of gross <coughs> domestic product. So it's okay, it's not huge, but it's a very important component of, gr of gross domestic profit. Uh, so uh, the. Uh, uh, okay, so I just wanted to start by thinking about nonprofits and maybe put the idea in your head of creating one. At some point in your life, sooner or later, um, I just give. I, I thought I'd start with some examples that are familiar to me of, of nonprofits, uh, and, and why you, you w when you're thinking of some activity or some idea you have, you can set it up as for profit or nonprofit, and, and let's just think about why why you would do that. So I'll give you an example. Uh, Peter Tufano, uh, he's a professor uh, at the Harvard Business School. Uh, set up a nonprofit on his own, just as a professor. Uh, I know him, so uh, it, and he, he gave it an inspirational name, Doorways to Dreams. Okay, and it's about personal finance and about helping people do things uh, do things better in their personal financing. So uh, one of his ideas, and he's promoting it with uh, he, he raises money for his foundation to promote it. One of them is to have an automatic checkoff on the tax form so that when you get a tax refund, instead of getting it in cash, it could go right into U.S. savings bonds to encourage people to save. All right? This is based on behavioral finance and the fact that a lot of people, especially lower income people, don't save. A little nudge like that would help them, uh, would help them save. Another thing, this sounds like a strange idea, but this is the kind of thing he can pursue on his own genius, uh, as long as he can raise money to get him to do it. He has the idea that a lot of people like to play the lottery. Okay, uh, obviously they do, uh, and they, they just are steady losers on this. You know, on average they'll always lose. But given that people want that, why don't we create savings plans that pay out randomly, like winning the lottery, uh, so that the government doesn't have any take in it? It just uh, is encourages saving. Now that's a strange original idea, which you might find. I don't know if I defended it well enough to you. You might find it hard to convince the government to do it, uh, but he can just do it. He doesn't have to talk to the government. He talks to individual banks, and he's gotten some now to offer this plan. But what was striking to me is he said, when I go into some company, trying to raise money for my uh, uh, projects. When I tell them I'm nonprofit, it changes the whole atmosphere, because they know that I'm not profiting from this, it, and so it opens up opportunities. Um, I'll give you a, a second example. Uh, Dean Carlin here at Yale is a, uh, he came here as an assistant professor. Uh, in 2002, he created a charity called Innovations for Poverty Action. So uh, this is Dean Carlin. Some of you may have taken his course. Anyone took his course? Some of you, yeah. I know, actually, I, um, the doorbell rang at my house and, uh, uh, here in New Haven, and a, a young woman was 
collecting money for charity, and it was his charity. I was shocked. <laughs> um, he's actually sending people door to door, <laughs> at least as part of his course. But you know, since then, he's he's uh, developed again it, when it's nonprofit and it's in aimed at alleviating poverty. He can bring in lots of money. So right now, uh, last year in 2010, uh, the income of uh, his uh, Innovations for Poverty Action was $25 million, and he has a staff of 500 people all over the world, uh, operating in a lot of poorer countries. Um, so uh, uh, that's, that's an a couple of examples that are familiar to me because they were set up by friends of mine. Uh, another example, uh, this is uh, Bill Drayton. Uh, he set up something called the Ashoka Foundation. Uh, Ashoka is a Hindi name for a, um, what is it? It's a uh, ruler of India who advocated nonviolence and philanthropy. Uh, and he, he went to Yale Law School as well as Harvard College, so sort of local here. But uh, uh, it's been a huge success, and it encourages sort of entrepreneurship or uh, social entrepreneurs. Uh, but he didn't stay on as a professor. He, he taught at uh, uh, Stanford Law School, but dropped out because he wanted to uh, pursue his nonprofit. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm amazed that these two guys can be both professors and running big nonprofit shops as well, but some people can do that. My last example is Wendy Kopp. I like this example for your age because her story starts with her senior essay. Do you know this story? Uh, she, wa <laughs> she was an undergraduate at Princeton, graduated in 1989. And she had to write a, basically, maybe they call it a senior thesis. Uh, and so she wrote something about education uh, that she had an idea that uh, often it's hard for elementary education to find people who are passionately committed to science or mathematics or other fields, because these people typically don't want to devote their lives to teaching. Uh, but they might devote a couple of years to teaching. And so she thought that it would be a good idea to get people, when they graduate from college, to spend a year or two in elementary education. Uh, and that it would be refreshing and good for the ed educational system to get enthusiastic young people who are really interested in the, in the disciplines. Uh, so that was her senior thesis. Now, now of course, you can't get the government to pay for this. Maybe you could. It might be hard because, well, the teachers' union might not like this or they might, you know, it, it's a sort of a controversial idea. Bec you know, some people would say someone who's taken uh, a course in mathematics at Yale University is really not qualified to teach young children because he or she didn't take the educational curriculum. And th that's always going to be controversial. But here, when we live in a society that emphasizes nonprofits, you don't have to convince the government, <laughs> all right? You convince anybody to, do it, to finance this, and you can do it. So right out, she was 21 years old. She graduated from Princeton. She raised $2.5 million in her first year uh, to set up an organization called Teach for America. Uh, and they, 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 the organization merely recruited uh, young people who had just graduated college to go into teaching. And so anyway, that's become her life's work uh, in the 20-plus um, years since. She's heading what she created. I like this story because some of you are writing senior <laughs> essays, right? And you should consider it as a model for some, you might consider it as a model for some great idea that you might have that you could carry to the world. And one way to make it happen is <laughs> If it's that kind of idea, you just set up a nonprofit right there. Um, actually, I have, uh, I wanted to give you some other examples. Uh, in New Haven, we have two major hospitals, okay? Where did they come from and why do we have them? Well, uh, one of them uh, is called 
Yale, New Haven. Okay. So uh, how did that get started? Well, it was started by a nonprofit uh, in 1826 called the General Hospital Society of Connecticut. Uh, back then, there weren't many hospitals, and so someone set up a nonprofit to set up a hospital. And it was then the only hospital in the state of Connecticut, and so they called it State Hospital. Uh, later, as more hospitals appeared, it didn't seem good to call it State Hospital anymore, so they changed the name to New Haven Hospital. Uh, that was in 1884. Um, and then in 1913, they joined with another nonprofit called Yale University, uh, and then later they changed their name to Yale New Haven Hospital. But it's been a nonprofit all the time. Now, there are for profit hospitals, but this one was always a nonprofit. Um, the other hospital that we have in New Haven is St. Raphael's, and that's newer. Uh, it was created in 1907. And the story is that the, uh, a group of physicians from the New Haven area thought we needed a second hospital. And they went to uh, Sisters of Charity, which is a, um, not a uh, I don't know much about them. It's a, nun a nun nunnery, I suppose, uh, and uh, worked with them to create a second hospital. Uh, and they chose the name Raphael after an archangel recognized by many faiths, which means God, God has healed. Uh, now, why? It's interesting to think about this hospital. So, whose idea was it, and how did it happen? Well, apparently, the idea wasn't from the Sisters of Charity, it was from physicians who were in New Haven. So, why did they go to the Sisters of Charity? Why didn't they just set up a for-profit hospital? They could, have, they, they could have bypassed them completely. What's the link? Well, I think that, uh, I don't know all of their reasons, but I'm suspecting the reasons are, is that when you affiliate with a religious organization, it gives a sense of moral mission and social purpose to the organization that it wouldn't have otherwise. And it makes it very clear that it's nonprofit and encourages people to donate. Uh, so I think that this same idea has dawned on many people. The people who see a need for a new hospital are probably not leaders of churches, but they see, it, uh, they see a, 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 um, a, a common interest in, uh, pursuing, uh, in pursuing hospitals. So, there have been many studies about for-profit versus non-profit hospitals and who gives the better care. Uh, I think that uh, the studies are generally inconclusive because even people who are operating for-profit hospitals have a social mission as well. Or, uh, uh, they have morals. It's not just churches. People outside of churches have morals as well. And so the actual distinction between for-profit and non-profit is often somewhat uh, ambiguous. Uh, so um, let me now move on to the. Uh, well, let, let me. Uh, uh, well, okay. Let, let me move on to the second point that I said I was going to talk about, which is government involvement in for profits. Uh, so. Governments uh, uh, exert control over both nonprofits and for profits. Uh, and it's often difficult <laughs> distinction between a government activity and a private activity because of the regulation that governments <coughs> impose uh, over, uh, over companies and the taxes they collect. Uh, so, let me first make it clear that every, every, virtually every country of the world has a substantial corporate profits tax, and in that sense, governments are co-owners of corporations, private. So the corporate 
profits tax. is in effect a sort of partial nationalization of all the private companies in, in the country. So in the U.S., it currently stands at 35 percent federal and up to 12 percent local, state and local, depending on the state. So it's as high as 37, 47 percent. It's basically half. So you could say that the U.S. government has nationalized close to half of the private sector. The government is collecting from their profits as if they were a shareholder. Uh, this is state and local. Uh, but it's the same in other countries or similar. Canada, uh, the, the uh, Ottawa collects 16.5 uh, percent, uh, and the provinces up to 16 percent. Uh, a little bit lower than the U.S. Japan. The, the national government has a 40.6 percent profit tax. Brazil, 34 uh, percent. You might think that under the Lula government, well, the, re the recent Lula government, they would be uh, more left wing and would have a higher profits tax, but they don't. It's about the same. Uh, China is 25 percent. India is 33. And I could go on and on. There's, uh, I, there's almost no country that doesn't have it. So, in that sense, everything is part of the government. It, it's, al it's about the same all over the world, and that's because I think there's a reason for that. Because if you charge too high a profits tax, uh, then, uh, uh, then business will leave your country. Why do we why do we charge a profits tax? Well, I think the corporate profits tax is justified by recognizing that this thing about for profit or private always has its limitations, and anything that's private is not completely isolated from other interests or. Activities. So, uh, I thought it would be useful to think of one example. Uh, there's a company called Tepco. You've heard of this company? <laughs> I don't. I don't expect that you would. It's the fourth the fourth largest electric power company in the world, and it's traded in the U.S. And uh, you may own shares in it and not know it. Because it's such a big and important com company, or at least your parents, good chance that they own shares in it, because they probably own some diversified portfolio in their pension plan, or maybe they even have it set up in a trust for you already. So, so don't uh, judge Tepco too harshly. All right, but let me just tell you about your investment in Tepco. Uh, guess what country it's in? Japan. You got <laughs> so somebody know. Uh, why would that matter right now? Big electric power company in Japan? Does that sound like a great investment? Yeah? They own the, uh, the power plant. That's right. They, they own uh, particularly the Fukushima power plant. So I, I checked out this morning uh, what the share price is going for in TEPCO. So uh, it was, uh, as of uh, you know, a month or so ago, $25 a share. And it's down to five dollars a share. It just went foot, and you know exactly why. So I looked this further. Uh, J.P. Morgan uh, says estimates now that claims against TEPCO will be twenty-five billion dollars or a couple of trillion yen. Um, but that's not all. They're also damaged, right? Everything's in ruins. So uh, some people are predicting that the TEPCO will go bankrupt. All right. So they've done all this. They've created this whole mess in Japan, and they're just going to go bankrupt. And, and we have limited liability, right? They're not going to come after you, right? The Japanese government could do diligence and find out that you own shares in TEPCO, and TEPCO was negligent, right? They messed up. They didn't do their safety uh, procedures well enough. But they'll never go after you, 
I mean, it, you know, it gets amb this is the whole idea of limited liability. So many people all over the world are owning shares, and we can't expect them to be responsible for. You can't inspect the Fukushima plant, even though you may be a beneficiary of its uh, pr profits. So, um, so that's why uh, they collect the corporate profits. So Japan is collecting 40 percent corporate profits tax, and that can be used to offset the the, uh, the damages that the Japanese government now has to pay for. So it all seems right. It's, there's a plan here. So uh, you wonder: Is TEPCO private or not? Well, it is private in the sense that there are shareholders and there are profits, profiters, but it's regulated by Japan, it's taxed by Japan, and Japan pays for their mistakes. So uh, that's, that's typical of. Uh, uh, so uh, I'll give you an, another uh, example uh, from this country uh, General Motors. Okay. Um, General Motors was the biggest car company in the United States, uh, and then it uh, had a little problem during the financial crisis and had to file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Now, you know, what, uh, the, the, what, what am I referring to when I say Chapter 11? The Bankruptcy Act has chapters, okay? And each chapter says something different. The two most important chapter for companies is Chapter Seven and Chapter Eleven. Okay, and what the bankruptcy law does is it creates a framework for dealing with insolvency. Uh, and uh, the framework says that a company that is in trouble can choose to apply. For bankruptcy, and there's basically two important ways to do that. Chapter seven details how you would one way you can apply for bankruptcy, and chapter eleven uh, uh, details another way. Chapter seven is liquidation. That means that uh, the company is in such trouble that we're going to shut it down and sell off all the assets. Uh, chapter 11 is for a company that is in trouble, but there's something worth salvaging in, the, in terms of operating, continuing the business. So that's what GM chose Chapter 11 bankruptcy. They thought, obviously, we're making cars for now close to 100 years. Well, at least, at least the companies that, that went together to form GM. And we have a big future. So we can't pay our bills now, but uh, we should continue. Uh, so they filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, but they were in such trouble that they couldn't get out of it. So the U.S. government and the Canadian government invested in uh, GM. Uh, what happened was uh, General Motors. Well, it's in the, they changed the name in the most subtle way. The official name of the company was General Motors Corporation. Okay. Uh, when they filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, the shareholders were wiped out. Uh, nobody got executed. <laughs> you, you lost all of your money. Uh, and so if you, have, if you find in your attic some nice, beautiful share certificates for General Motors Corporation, you can just use them as wallpaper or whatever. They're worthless. But if it's different, if it says General Motors Company, uh, because that refers to the new GM, they wanted to change the name, but they didn't really want to change the name. They had to change the name so that people wouldn't confuse the two. So what happened? How did we get a new GM? Well, the new GM was owned by the U.S. government, uh, equal to uh, uh, U.S. It was equal to 60. Point, uh, where is it? I had it here. 60.8 percent U.S. Uh, Canada uh, owned um, 12 percent. The UAW, United Auto Workers, uh, got 17.5 percent. Why did why did the union, by the way, get 17 percent of GM? 
Well, I don't know the whole story, but I'm, I'm sure it has something to do with GM's obligations. Maybe they failed on something. Other. I don't know the details, but it seemed in the, in the bankruptcy proceedings that the implicit debts that the company owed to their workers would be re represented by a share in the company. Uh, and, and, and then the rest went to uh, the bondholders, people who owned debt, not equity, who owned debt in GM, got the remaining share. And they also got warrants, which are options to buy more shares, which will dilute down the U.S. and Canada and UAW shares. So that's the settlement. The result of the settlement was that uh, it was a government-owned organization. And uh, now they've just done an IPO, so they're, they're reversing uh, this ownership structure. But the, the point is that companies that look private may end up government <laughs> uh, uh, eventually, one, one time or another. And uh, so, uh, Uh, companies have to kind of think of themselves as, uh, even in the arch capitalist country like the United States, as partly government, uh, uh, government organizations. By the way, there's something else called personal bankruptcy. Uh, and uh, uh, personal bankruptcy is another involvement of the government in in uh, risk management. And you as an individual can declare bankruptcy. And you can choose these chapters, or you can do this other uh, provisions as well. Uh, but you can use uh, Chapter 7 to wipe out all of your debts. Uh, the new bankruptcy law that uh, Congress passed a few years ago uh, attempts to limit your ability to do that. But uh, within limits, uh, the same government is kind of a shareholder, uh, uh, just as uh, just as individuals are. So, um, I mean, a shareholder and individuals uh, lifetime incomes. I guess what I'm saying is that uh, the whole idea of public versus private is a complicated one. And what seems public at, another, at one time will seem private at another. Um, the, the behavior of nonprofits is not strikingly different than the behavior of profits. Uh, so uh, so I, I, I found a statistic that 42% um, of nonprofits pay bonuses to their executives. That is, they're using the same kind of incentive plans that private corporations do. Uh, why would they do that? Well, they do that because they have to hire people. And people in the for-profit sector are getting bonuses. So how do you hire someone and get someone good unless you pay the bonus as well? Uh, the, the government faces a big problem in that uh, the public is very sensitive to paying high salaries to government employees because they think it's unfair. Why should some government bureaucrat be paid more than I get? Uh, as a result, they have trouble hiring good people. But in the nonprofit sector, the uh, nonprofit sector is not constrained. Well, they have some, some constraints over, uh, they're regulated to prevent them from stealing the money. But, uh, I think that you know, part of the idea of having nonprofits, I, this is a general point, is that uh, the government is kind of confined to politically correct conventional wisdom type activities. And, in, uh, and th they can do things that are just generally acknowledged by the average person as a good thing. Uh, but they can't do something innovative as well or controversial as well. Uh, and I think that uh, it's often in those controversial things that uh, some of our biggest progress is made. So I gave the example of um, Charles Darwin and his professor uh, who uh, advocated his, uh, his um, voyage around the world. 
uh, the pro professor, I'm trying to see what his name, Henslow, I think it was, was actually a um, John Stevens Henslow, a botanist, but also a advocate of natural theology. And he sent Darwin out on this voyage because he thought that studying nature enabled you to discover God. Uh, little did he know <laughs> Darwin would end up an atheist after his uh, voyage. But it's this kind of weird stuff that gets financed. Or Wendy Kopp, I gave another example, whose ideas were too controversial. I mean, the idea of, of sending someone out who didn't have an education diploma uh, 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 to teach, too controversial. Uh, so, uh, so I think that there is a, uh, maybe a grow growing recognition of the importance of having people who are, well, there's a term, social entrepreneurs. Uh, these are, uh, I don't know whether they're for profit or non profit, but they're people who do things out of a sense of mission for. For the uh, for beyond making money, but uh, uh, helping uh, helping the world, and you see this reported in newspapers and magazines that there's a, that the 21st century seems to be a century where there's more and more of this kind of thing, and it it it's it's in substantial measure I think nonprofit. Um, Okay, then now I wanted to move to um, the third uh, thing, which I said is uh, uh, municipal or state and local finance. It's a big topic, but uh, an awful lot of what gets done in this country is done by state and local governments. Uh, it's something on the order, it's bigger than the federal government. The state and local governments spend about twice as much money as the U.S. federal government. They run all the public schools, fire departments, police departments, most of the parks. What else? I mean, uh, a lot of things are being run by state and local governments. Uh, and so, uh, I think another thing uh, that uh, that uh, one could do to get make things happen in the world, I mentioned the possibility of setting up a state and uh, setting up a a nonprofit. You can make things happen by doing that, but you can also make things happen by approaching a local government and saying to them, I think that uh, you would do well to build a hospital or, or build a bridge or build a new school uh, or um, even kind of business-oriented things that uh, would be projects that the government can undertake, uh, and then they can finance it as a as a uh, as a state and local government. Now, one thing in the United States, every state uh, in the United States has a balanced budget rule. That is. They have to tax people for uh, all of the expenditures they make. They are not allowed to go into debt. But we have to be careful about what the balanced budget uh, rules in their constitution say, because obviously there is municipal debt. <laughs> governments do borrow money. Uh, state and local governments in the United States have Typically, it depends across, differs across state, but they typically have two budgets. They have an operating budget and a capital budget. The operating budget is what has to be balanced according to their constitutions. So the operating government budget involves a list of all the expenditures they made for operations and the taxes. So the, and they cannot. Uh, it differs by state and how it's worded, but they cannot plan to run a deficit in, in some state. Or if they do run a deficit on the operating budget, they have to correct it soon and have a plan for correcting it soon. But the capital budget is different. 
the, uh, it also, in, if, a, if a country, if a city builds a new school, for example, that's not an operating expense, right? It's not, it's, it's a capital expense. So it's building something that will last through the ages. Um, and so it goes on the capital budget and not on the operating <laughs> budget. And, and all of the states allow this. They can raise money by borrowing, and they routinely do that. Uh, and uh, so that means they get into debt, and then they uh, have a potential for, uh, for going bankrupt as well. Um, so, uh, so this is the way it, uh, this is the way it works. Imagine that you're setting up a, a small, a new town, and it's small right now, okay? Little town. But you know, we know that people are coming this way, and it's going to be a big town in 20, 30 years. So what do we do? Uh, well, you lay out the streets and you plan for a big town. Right now, you better plan for it, right? Or it'll get congested. So you better lay out wide enough streets. That's easy to do. But uh, you, you know, uh, you kind of want to build the streets before the people come. You have the layout and have lots and have it all planned. And how about a sewage system, okay? Uh, the people aren't here yet, okay? And, and so, uh, so you construct, you consult a sewage uh, uh, engineer, and the engineer tells you, you know, if you're going to build a sewage system, you should do it all at once. It's not, it's to be too expensive to do it year after year, just adding a little bit and a little bit. You've got to have a plan, you have an idea where the city is going. Let's build it for a city of 20,000 people. We can do it now, but it will cost you, you know, $100 million. So what do you do? <laughs> you might say, we can't pay for that. There's only, there's only 30 people living in this town. How do we come up with 100 million? Obviously, you borrow, right? You put it on the capital budget. And that is fair and, and just, right? Because then, as people come to the city, they, uh, they um, will then pay taxes and pay back the debt. This is the way it works, and it's the way it's always worked. Now, you could say, well, no, it shouldn't be this way. Why don't we have all of the individual people pay for their own sewers and add to the sewer system as they build their houses. It's not going to work, right? That would, be, that would be crazy. You've got to build the whole system in advance. And so that's what, uh, uh, that's what city governments do routinely. And they, d they go deeply into debt as a result as of, of, uh, of having, uh, having created all of these capital uh, uh, investments and having the debt against them. So, you, so, you be, so your city that has 20 people is borrowed $100 million, and it's going to be a city of 20,000 people, it thinks. What if it doesn't work? What if they don't come? You know, your plan was wrong. Then the city's at risk of going bankrupt, right? So uh, there's another whole chapter for municipal bankruptcy. Chapter nine of the bankruptcy code. Uh, and chapter nine is for city government. Uh, there's a problem is that cities going bankrupt are different because they don't have any shareholders, right? Uh, uh, they do have an ability to tax people. They, you know, it's a question of how much you should tax people in a bankrupt city. Uh, if you tax them too much, they'll just all leave. So uh, it, it's a subtle problem. Uh, uh, but fortunately, uh, there haven't been, uh, and I'm not sure we really understand why, there have not been many municipal bankruptcies uh, at all. Uh, between 1975, uh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, do I have data on, I thought I had data on numbers of bankruptcy. You know, there are some famous municipal bankruptcies. New York City uh, went bankrupt. Or, or it was about to declare bankruptcy in the 1970s, but it was saved by bailouts. Maybe that's the reason why we don't. Basically, when New York City said that it couldn't pay its debts, uh, the state of New York came by with a bailout. And then uh, also, although reluctantly and with a lag, the U.S. federal government came in with a bailout. Uh, so. Um, Big city, so New York never declared bankruptcy. Oh, a lot of cities will have what's called a rainy day fund. 
So uh, they will accumulate assets to help them over a troubled time. So it, when you, you can uh, collect somewhat higher taxes, uh, and, and then you have an endowment. The city has an endowment, uh, which can help tide them over through difficult times. Uh, but uh, uh, recently, <laughs> most of the rainy day funds have been exhausted. Uh, the the uh, uh, state and local governments saved for a rainy day, and this was a rainy day, the, the financial crisis. And so most uh, state and local governments are in trouble right now because of the recession causing their tax revenues to decline. And there is increasing worry about municipal bankruptcies. So I said that there, there haven't been many historically, but there, there people are edgy now, thinking that there could be some now because of the financial crisis. And so the yields on municipal bonds have gone up. So uh, municipal bonds are tax free in the United States. So if the city of New Haven, um, uh, if the city of New Haven issues debt and you buy the debt, you are not subject to federal income tax on the interest that you earn. That's because in the Constitution, it's, it says that there's a separation between federal and state. The federal cannot tax the state, so they don't tax your municipal bond. There's a subsidy toward municipal bonds uh, implicit in the, uh, in the tax law. Um, by the way, I, I, let me just mention that this, this taxable, uh, the, the fact that municipal bonds issued by uh, local governments are not subject to taxes, extends as well to Yale University. So Yale University issues bonds that are in the same category as municipal bonds, and they're not taxed. So there's an advantage, a tax advantage, and especially higher income investors like to invest in municipal bonds because it matters more for higher income investors because the tax rate hits them more, and so there's an advantage. So Yale issues municipal bonds, and Yale is an uh, important debtor. Um, now, you might wonder about that. <laughs> uh, so uh, let's talk about Yale as uh, a municipal bond issuer. Yale has an endowment of $16 billion uh, as of last year, uh, and it has a debt of $2.5 billion. So that leaves Yale with only 13.5 billion in assets after debt. So uh, you might say, why does Yale borrow money? Why, it, right? I mean, it's got 16 billion invest in. Why is it borrowing? Well, there, there are many reasons, I suppose, but the immediate and obvious reason that comes to mind is that Yale borrows money because it can borrow at a tax subsidized rate. Right? If the Yale's debt is um, not subject to income tax, then that means it can borrow at a lower rate. Uh, and Yale would be inclined, or any nonprofit uh, that can issue tax, uh, non taxable debt, would like to do that in order to invest in assets that are taxable. Because we don't, Yale doesn't pay any taxes on either of them. So uh, you see what I'm saying? There's a, the municipal debt has a lower yield in the market because everybody knows it's not subject to income taxes, so it has a, a low yield. So Yale could issue that debt and use the money to invest in high-yielding things that are taxable, and it's not going to pay taxes on them either. So there, there's an arbitrage game that Yale could play, or any nonprofit could play, uh, but it does not because it's, it's not allowed to unless it's investing unless it's using the proceeds of the debt uh, for uh, appropriate causes. So, uh, see so you have to understand, this is why Yale University has a substantial debt and why the city of New Haven has a substantial debt. Uh, it all makes sense in some basic uh, finance um, uh, framework. Um, 
But uh, there's a lot of concern about uh, indebtedness right now because with the financial crisis, the U.S. and Europe and many other countries are suffering debt crises right now. So it's renewing calls for a balanced budget amendment. The U.S. government does not have a balanced budget <coughs> amendment like the state governments do. And in fact, the U.S. government has only one budget. It does not have a capital budget. So in some sense, the state governments are more sophisticated than the federal government in the U.S. in that they have the, the distinction between operating and capital budgets. Uh, but I guess the, the reason why the U.S. the U.S. government has considered adopting a capital budget, but it has never done so, I think maybe it's because the U.S. government has fewer investments like schools or um, uh, parks or uh, other uh, water facilities, sewage facilities. Uh, it doesn't do that kind of thing, so it doesn't have as many clearly capital uh, projects. Uh, it has a much bigger debt <laughs> than the state and local governments. Um, okay, so um, I guess then I'll move to my last topic today, which is about uh, government social insurance. And this is uh, along uh, the same theme. I'm talking today about the roles of finance is about risk management, and it's about incentivization. And uh, some, of, some of the basic roles are classified under the rubric of social insurance, which is offered by the government. Uh, and this is a huge topic. And uh, let me. Um, social insurance refers to insurance that is not available by a private insurance company, uh, but that uh, but that are offered by generally by governments. And let me just give some examples. I, I, I put in first progressive taxes. Okay, progress, progressive taxes are income taxes that tax higher income people at a lower rate. Uh, and progressive taxes uh, have increasingly, in recent years, uh, adopted something analogous to the Earned Income Tax Credit, the EITC. That's the U.S. name for it, but it's now in many countries around the world that provides negative taxes for the lowest income people. Uh, so the effect of progressive taxes with earned income tax credit is to make, to insulate people somewhat from shocks to their income. Uh, they, they call it an earned income tax credit, by the way, because you have to have earned income to get the credit. You can't be just unemployed. But if you are working and earning very little, especially if you have a family, then you have a negative income tax rate so that you, the government augments your low income with a negative uh, tax. I think this is very important, uh, and it actually is uh, effective. Uh, Otherwise, the world would be much, <laughs> much more unequal than it is now. I would add, by the way, uh, public services, which are offered out of taxes uh, to everyone in a country, notably education. Uh, school systems are generally <laughs> free. Uh, and that uh, is, again, something that these are all, uh, I, I consider these a form of insurance because. They benefit people who are unsuccessful in earning money. So it's like an insurance program against possible failure in uh, achieving uh, status in the economic system. Um, so we also have, uh, I'll go up here, three, social security. 
and I'm using U.S. terms, but these are terms that uh, that uh, these things happen in all, virtually all advanced countries. In the U.S., we call it OASD. Uh, that stands for Old Age Survivors and Disability Insurance. Uh, old age insurance is pensions. And that's the biggest part of the social security system in the United States. It's insuring you again. Well, it's really something you know is going to happen. You're going to get old someday. <laughs> but uh, we call it insurance. Um, survivor's insurance is life insurance. I mean, it, it benefits you. Uh, uh, you're getting too old for this now. But if your parents die when you're young, the U.S. government will give you an income. You're an orphan. You have nothing. Your parents died and left you nothing. You get survivor's insurance. You didn't know you had this, right? It's not publicized a lot, uh, but it's part of what protects people, and it's offered by the government. Uh, and then thirdly, disability insurance, again, offered by the government, uh, is against you breaking your neck and becoming paralyzed, okay? Or, or anything like that that makes it impossible for you to work. Uh, the U.S. government will give you an income for life. So if you are permanently paralyzed, you get an income for life. All three of these are purchasable in the private sector. You can buy a pension. You can buy uh, survivor's insurance. They don't call that. They call it life insurance. Uh, it's just turning it around to a different name. Um, the, the sellers of life insurance don't want to remind you that you already have a life insurance policy from the government. Uh, because <laughs> you might say, well, I got enough already. So they give it a different name and they uh, call it, the, they probably won't remind you that you have it. And then you can buy disability insurance. Uh, so, but part of the problem with uh, private offering of these insurances, disability insurance, if it's offered privately, suffers a selection bias problem that some people who realize that they are going to have a disability will, will buy the insurance right away. And then we have health insurance. Uh, and I don't want to use the U.S. as an example for this because we're, we're kind of a laggard on most of these things. Uh, but we had a new health bill that passed under Obama uh, last year, and it's starting to gear up. But the U.S. Uh, is not the world leader in health insurance. Uh, but it, does, uh, it has currently about 40 million people with no health insurance. Uh, and then there's uh, workers' compensation. Uh, th these are the main um, aspects of social insurance uh, today. Workers' compensation is an older form of health insurance that preceded health insurance, uh, at least in the United States. Uh, and it uh, compensates workers for um, accidents that occurred at work. And th in the U.S., this came in in the uh, progressive era. Uh, but all these are risk management devices that are offered by governments. Uh, now, these uh, uh, social insurance schemes are relatively recent innovations. And in fact, I think that um, the, the first national, I know that, the first national social insurance uh, programs uh, began in Germany in um, the late 19th century. Uh, so uh, another theme of this course has been that the ability to do things like this requires a developed society with a certain technology, with an information technology, with a bureaucratic technology. And they haven't been around for that long. If you go back in history, one, uh, 200, 300 or more years, there wasn't social insurance anywhere. Well, ver <laughs> maybe there was in some isolated community, but basically it didn't exist. Uh, and so the history of, of social insurance is interesting. 
And I think it, uh, it mimics, it, it, it um, reflects information technology growth. Uh, so the, con the country that is most remarkable for having invented social insurance is Germany uh, under uh, Otto von Bismarck uh, in the 1880s. Uh, and I think that it happened there first because of the information technology. Um, but uh, uh, it's an interesting story that uh, there were various attempts to start social insurance uh, in different parts of the, uh, uh, of the world that were half-hearted and failed. In the United Kingdom, in the late 1700s, uh, there was uh, a town called Spainamland, uh, a tiny town in the UK, that decided they would start social insurance. And they decided that there was a living wage that anyone ought to be able to earn, and anyone who earned less than that would have the difference paid by the town. So the town, uh, it's called the Spainam Spainamland Law, uh, and that town offered to pay the difference. Uh, the problem was it didn't work. Too many people reported that they were getting less income than the, than the living income that they defined. Uh, and the, comp the, the, the town discovered it was being ripped off. Uh, and so they couldn't, what the problem is they couldn't identify what a person's income really was accurately. And they couldn't tell whether someone was goofing <coughs> off or not. Uh, and so they dropped it. Uh, it was, uh, uh, th I think there are other examples of failed experiments like this. But uh, in, uh, in it, it took hold first in Germany in the 1880s. Uh, uh, and they got um, accident insurance, health insurance, and old age insurance or retirement for the everyone in Germany in the 1880s. And it was considered a fiasco by other countries of the world. When, when Germany announced these plans to create social insurance, the London Times wrote an article saying this whole thing will fa fall through and fail. The government is going to run all of these insurance policies for something like, I don't know how many, mi I think there were 11 million workers in Germany at the time. And th in London they said, you gotta be kidding. No government in the world has ever been, ever managed to run something like this. Let's think particularly about retirement insurance. The German government set up a plan whereby people would contribute over their working lives to the social security system, and the system would uh, then, years later, 30, 40 years later, keep a tab about how much they'd contributed, and then pay them a pension for the rest of their lives. <coughs> so the, the Times wondered aloud, are, are they gonna mess this up? They've gotta keep records for 40 years, and we're talking about the government keeping records. <laughs> and they thought nobody can really manage to do this, uh, and that it will, collapse and ruin. Uh, but it didn't. The Germans managed to do this uh, in the 1880s uh, for the first time. Uh, and it, actually it was an idea that was copied all over the world. So why is it that Germany was able to do something like this in the 1880s when it was not doable anywhere else? It had never been done until that time. I think this has to do ultimately with uh, technology. And uh, technology, particularly information technology, was advancing rapidly in the 19th century. Not as rapidly as in the 20th, but uh, rapidly advancing. So what happened in, the, uh, in, um, in Europe that made it possible to uh, to institute these radical new ideas. Uh, so um, I just give a list of one thing. 
uh, paper. This is information technology, but you don't think. In, uh, in the 18th century, paper, ordinary paper, was very expensive because it was made from cloth in those days. They didn't know how to make paper from wood, and it had to be handmade. Uh, as a result, you, uh, if, if you bought a newspaper in, say, 1790, it would be just one page, and it would be printed on the smallest print because it was just so expensive. It would cost you like twenty dollars to buy the, in, in today's prices to buy one newspaper. Uh, then they invented the paper machine that made it mechanically, and they made it out of wood pulp, and suddenly the cost of paper went down. By the way, I found an old textbook from Yale University from 1837. Uh, I, I, it's still sitting there on the shelf in the library. I was looking. The, uh, we were using um, uh, a Principles of Economics textbook for all Yale students. They all had to take the same course. And it was a nice little book, but it was so small, I picked it up. I mean, it was like, like that big. <laughs> you could put it in your pocket. I think it's because books were just expensive. So the students, you have these huge textbooks now, right, that weigh so much, they probably challenge your back. <laughs> back then, you could carry your books. There was a fundamental economic difference, and so uh, paper was one of the things. And you never got a receipt for anything. When you bought something, you go to a store and buy something, you think you'd get a receipt? Absolutely not, because it's too, well, they wouldn't know why, but that's the ultimate reason, too expensive. And so, so they invented paper, too. Carbon paper. Do you people even know what this is? <laughs> Anyone here heard of carbon paper? <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. It used to be that when you wanted to make a copy of something, you didn't have any copying machines, you would buy the special paper, which was, uh, do, you know, do you know what, I have to explain this to you? <laughs> you know what carbon paper is? <laughs> You put it between two sheets of paper, and you write on the upper one, and it comes through on the lower one. This was never invented until the 19th century. Nobody had carbon paper. You couldn't make copies of any. There was no way to make a copy. They hadn't invented photography yet, right? Uh, they, hadn't, they had no way to make a copy. You had to just hand copy everything. Um, and so, uh, Oh, the first copying machines, maybe I mentioned that, didn't come until the 20th century. And they were, they were photographic. Uh, and the typewriter. That was invented in the 1870s. Now, it may seem like a small thing, but it was a very important thing because you could make accurate documents, and they were not subject to misinterpretation because of sloppy handwriting. And I'm doing sloppy handwriting here for you. But, um, I'm using the old technology here. Uh, but uh, the typewriter, and you could also make many copies. You can make six copies at once with carbon paper. And, and they're all exactly the same. You can file them in a different, each one in a different filing cabinet for standardized forms. Uh, these are uh, forms that had fill in the blank with the typewriter. Uh, they had filing cabinets. Uh, and finally, uh, bureaucracy developed. They had management school, particularly in Germany. Uh, it was famous for its management schools and its uh, business schools. Uh, so you had a, you had, oh, I should add also postal service. If you wanted to mail a letter in 1790, uh, you'd have trouble, and it would cost you a lot. Most people in 1790 got maybe one letter a year, something, or two letters a year, that was it. But uh, in the 19th century, they started setting up post offices all over the world, and the Germans were particularly good at this kind of bureaucratic uh, thing. So there were post offices in every town. And the social security system operated through the post offices. Because once you have post offices in every town, you would go to make your payments on social security at the post office, and they would give you stamps, and you'd paste them on a card. And that's how you could uh, show that you um, uh, uh, show that you had paid. So, uh, uh, so I, I think that this kind of information technology brought us the social security system, uh, and the kinds of advances in information technology that we've seen more recently 
will eventually lead to changes in the system. Ultimately, technology drives finance, and, uh, and the, uh, uh, the system uh, the, the system responds to changes in technology. Uh, so, uh, all right. So, I just uh, want to just wrap up. I, I talked today about uh, a broader social purpose that's served by our finance, and it takes place in terms of for-profit uh, as well as non-profit. But the distinction between for-profit and non-profit is is a subtle one. I think what happens is people think of a purpose of something they want to achieve, and then they think, how can I use our financial technology to incentivize people to subscribe capital to this project or to, or to give their personal attention to this project? And then we have the, the, our system of finance has a lot of things, a lot of devices that can allow the uh, <coughs> provenance of capital and that allow and, and that will f will incentivize people. Um, so uh, uh, I, th I think I th another theme of this course has been behavioral finance. That I think people are psychological; they have emotions and they uh, they they react in complicated ways. Uh, uh, one of the oldest themes of economics is that people respond to incentives, but uh, they respond to please to their morality as well or their um, ideals as well. Uh, when we talk about nonprofit sector, it seems that the, uh, the, the financial arrangements reflect a combination of selfish uh, money uh, <laughs> oriented incentives and more social purpose incentives. Uh, and the same thing goes with government activities. Uh, anyway, I, I guess I, uh, I'm, I have one more lecture, and I'm going to talk next time more broadly about what, uh, what finance offers us uh, and how it allows us to achieve uh, social purposes.